steady sound, steady ground we lay upon. So the sun stays in my heart. Thread Hello, my name is Emma Prack. I am the founder of Project Sonrisa and the creator of our minds. I have brown shoulder length hair and I'm wearing a green stripy top. My pronouns are she, they. Mental health is an incredibly stigmatised topic. We often hear the phrase, you're not alone, and there's people that have gone through similar things to you and come out the other side to it. However, it's so difficult to truly feel this when there's a lack of representation in mainstream media. What do I mean by that? I mean, a lot of media that is already out there has a sort of negative narrative surrounding mental health that focuses on crisis point and it focuses on sort of when people are that that emergency stage rather than their whole journey and everything about that that's contributed to where they are and that's why I believe that it's really important that we fill the gap and make sure that every aspect of mental health is truly portrayed and that's where our minds came from. It's a collection of unique stories from people all across Scotland um, just talking about things like religion, race, sexuality, gender, just loads of topics that now that you're thinking about it, play a vital role in mental health and mental well-being. This documentary was produced with accessibility as a core value, something that we believe should be included as, in as many pieces of media as possible. Everybody has mental health, which means everybody should be able to access media that relates to mental health. We have included a variety of different things, and you can find out more about what these are and why they were included at our website, which is www.projectsonresa.com. Hello, my name is Emma. I'm 18 years old, and I'm from Cumbernauld, Scotland. I'm from Motherwell, Scotland. I'm from Dundee, Scotland. Hello, my name's Morag. Hi, I'm name 52 is years old. I'm Ash Hello, Hello, my name is Hi, Dex. my name is Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Molly. I am nine. Wisha, which is nearby Glasgow. I am from Paisley in Scotland. I'm from Cumbernauld in Scotland. Um, I from Highlands. Looking at the world right now, I see cars moving, trees slaying, uh, and buildings standing still. Looking out at the world right now, I see blue Looking out at the world right now, I see potential for change. Looking around and the world right now, I'm looking at lots and lots of diverse blue skies and sunshine. Um, why does mental health matter? Me mental health matters because we all have... Mental health matters because the ability we have to cope with the ups and downs um, of life impacts You can get really ill uh, if you don't look after your, um, your brain, because, your mind. It matters because mental health should be as understood as physical mental health, health but it isn't just now. it's part of our foundation as humans. And everything we do and everything we are is built on that. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Shafawa Goss. I am wearing black glasses. I have black middle-length hair. I'm wearing a grey shirt and a, like, a blue denim jacket. My pronouns are she, her, and I am MSYP for Cumberland and Cliffside. In your opinion, do people talk about mental health as much as they should? I don't believe people talk as much as they should. In the way that they should, I think there is a lot of hype around about social media and there's a lot of things, but meaningful talk, I don't think there's as much as there needs to be. Have you ever struggled with your mental health and what helped? I have struggled a lot with my mental health, especially regarding my disability. So a lot of my first year and just all of my high school career, I, I was very severely bullied. Um, there wasn't really a spot where I wasn't bullied. And it took a massive toll on my mental health. I didn't want to go to school, I didn't want to speak to anyone, and I was just constantly in a bad mood. Nothing could make me feel better. And it's not really been fixed. It still happens. I still go through those rough days, and I still have those days where all I can hear is people saying horrible things to me. But I've taken that pain and kind of put it, focused it somewhere else. And that is what makes me feel better. I got myself involved with you know, SYP and the Youth Forum and all these things and it was almost a distract me but I did make quite a lot of good friends who helped me, you know. I did. After I had my second child, um, I really struggled and I didn't see it coming, I think was the worst part about it. Um, it was just kind of by fluke. Somebody asked me, you know, how are you doing? And that was it. I kind of, you know, broke down at that point. Um, and to be honest, just talking and finding out I wasn't the only person going through the same thing and I didn't need to hold it all together. Um, but I think definitely 
I just didn't see it coming and that was really, really difficult. If you could do one thing to change or improve mental health support or services, what would it be and why? I think one of the major things we find, um, especially in my role as a youth worker supporting young people, is the waiting time for people to get support I, I find unacceptable. I, I don't think it's positive for young people. I, I don't think they feel that they can go and get the services that they need when they need them. I would probably just make it more accessible, more easy to reach, especially from people who might not feel the most comfortable saying that they are struggling if they've come from that kind of background, but it is seen as a stigma. It should be more accessible, especially for kids from different cultures, different religions, where their mental health needs may be different because they live such a different life. It's really interesting that Shafa highlighted the point about accessibility for people that come from different backgrounds, particularly from different religions and different beliefs. Um, this was something that I wanted to know more about. I wanted to know how identity and cultures relate to mental health, how that is a really important part of people's lives. So I travelled up to Kirkcaldy and Fife to speak to Ramiza. I'm Ramiza Ahmed. I have long black hair and I have glasses and I'm wearing like a pink jumper. Um, I am the MSYP for the Kirkcaldy constituency. I live with my two younger sisters and my mum and I go to secondary school and hopefully I'll be going to uni to do forensic science. <laughs> okay, how does mental wellbeing impact your day-to-day -day life? So I grew up in a predominantly white school and I know that sounds weird um, but even from growing up and being in that environment I struggled as it was because um, with my background I never really knew my identity as it was and then growing up with people who were in like a predominantly white area it was really hard to un like understand myself and I also got really badly bullied so that was like a bad enough set in itself but when I hit secondary school um, it was making friends, the socialising and things like that and nobody really wanted to be friends with me because then again it was still predominantly white and I struggled with friends and people not understanding my culture and background which made it harder for me just to be myself so I was changing myself for other people and that affected me a lot. How does your religion impact your mental wellbeing? So I would say it does take a toll on me in the sense that am I a good enough Muslim in the way that I follow my principles and the way that I've been brought up and especially when you see other Muslims and being brought and raised in this country um, it's kind of different to where it is in Pakistan they're full on like religious and especially my family they're, they're more religious so you kind of look at them and then you look at yourself and you're just like am I religious enough um, I have a bad habit of overthinking a lot and having this guilt over nothing and it's like am I doing the right things I, I know I don't pray all the time and that is one thing that um, I do beat myself up over a lot and reading the Quran and doing stuff like that and I know I'm not a perfect Muslim but when I do pray and when I do read the Quran I put my full effort into it. In three words how would you describe the relationship you have with your religion? So I would say it's conflicting because I've had periods of time where I've not given up with the religion but I've had to take a break and it's not like a full-on break but it's just like a take a moment, you've had a rough time in life but it's a test, that's how I see it. Loving because at the end of the day I pick myself back up and I've always got that support in a sense and then support in as well because I just feel better with myself after I've kind of had the religious thought and things like that. If you had one thing you could say to someone who's struggling with their mental health right now, what would it be? If you don't have someone to reach out to find something you're passionate about and focus on that. For example, for me it was music, um, being able to listen to different songs that expressed my emotions in a way that people couldn't understand, that was something that really hit me. So find something you're passionate about and it will help you in the times that you can't focus on yourself or prioritise yourself and then when you're in a better mindset, you will and you'll push through it. What's your name? Safa Ahmed. Aww. And what age are you? When are you going to be five? Do you know? August. 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 And how are you? Good. Good? Why are you so good? Because I'm always good. It's really interesting that Ramiza highlighted waiting times and the time it takes to access mental health support and services. It's something that Lindsay also said that she thinks is far too long that people wait too many months, weeks, years even to access the support they need. I spoke to Ellie who shares her experience of grief and the loss of a loved one. This next section is dedicated to her mum. 
Hi, my name is Ellie, I'm 18, my pronouns are she, her, I'm wearing a pink top and I have blonde hair. Do you think there's a stigma surrounding mental health? Yeah, I think there's still so much stigma around mental health and I think that the system and support structures we have in place currently can add to that stigma when it should be helping reduce it. But I do think that there's so much amazing work going on on social media and this documentary, for example, to try and help raise awareness and reduce some of the stigma we still have around mental health. What are your thoughts and opinions on mental health services and what sort of experiences have you got with them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important that there are the correct systems in place for all young people that need to ask for support. You know, I don't think people should have to wait until things reach a crisis point to receive help. You know, it's also so important that the support can be tailored to individual needs and that service providers don't invalidate or dismiss the experiences of young people. You know, personally, my experience, my mum passed away just before I left school and although I had amazing friends and family to lean on for support, I would have liked to have been able to get some advice from someone who's trained in bereavement and grief and maybe like more of a professional. You know, the time was already challenging enough, but the way the exam structure was working that year, I still had to sit exams and it was very overwhelming and a lot of stress to be under all at once. You know, there are some charities which are doing amazing work on this issue, but I don't re didn't realise how little that was catered to specifically young people who were grieving. And that experience is so different to adults and really young children. So there needs to be something there. If you could change one thing about mental health services, whether it's your local area, the world, Scotland, like anything like that, any level, uh, what would it be? Why? Although I don't really have experience, you know, engaging with mental health services myself, I think one thing we're always hearing is lack of funding and waiting times and there's nothing, even if there's a waiting time for a specific service, there's nothing to bridge that gap and I think that you can't just leave a young person um, who's struggling alone and with no support while they're waiting. Is there somebody out there right now that's listening to this right now that has a similar story or a similar experience to you? What would you say to them? I would say look on social media, you know, there are lots of accounts and networks of other young people who are going through similar things, you know, grieving. And I think in a really lonely time, it can help you make you feel like you're not the only one going through it, even if someone's story is different to yours. You know, it also helps, as you can see, other young people later on in their grief. And for me, it gave me hope that I'd be able to find ways of coping with the loss and that there were other people out there who'd struggled with the same thing. If I could say one thing to a world leader in mental health, it would be listen to young people's experiences and give weight to our opinions and create space for change. Because if the system doesn't get it right for every single young person, then it needs to be reviewed and changed. Men's mental health is particularly stigmatised. Men are four times more likely to commit suicide than any other gender. I wanted to know what it's like to grow up as a guy through your teenage years. So I spoke to Sam and Gavin who share their experiences during lockdown, as well as their perception and idea of toxic masculinity and the idea that men don't cry. Hi, my name is Sam. I use he him pronouns. I've got brown hair, green eyes, and I'm wearing a black and white stripy shirt. In your opinion, do people speak about mental health as much as they should? No, I don't think so. I think they feel like there's a stigma and people don't want to offload onto others, like give someone else their problems, but it's okay, you shouldn't feel ashamed of your problems. People will be willing to listen if they want me to know. If you could change one thing about mental health services in your school or in Scotland or in the UK or in the world, what would it be and why? Having more mental health services and a wider variety of mental health services. Interesting. What do you mean by that? So, if you have more mental health services, it means there's more capacity, which means they're easier to access, which will reduce waiting lists. And then having a variety is having a men mental health services that work for each individual. There's group sessions, single sessions, online, telephone, web chats, that sort of thing. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is, is Gavin. My pronouns are he, him. I have just left high school and I'm starting university in, in a couple of months and I play, I play a bit of volleyball sometimes for some fun. Um, in your opinion, do people talk about their mental health as much as they should? I, I think it's a, it's a difficult one to answer because it's 
not necessarily a case of, yeah, maybe they, they should talk about it, but it's also whether they, they feel like they can talk about it. Yeah. But I think there's a variety of reasons for it can do with their upbringing, their surroundings, who they're friends with, who they feel they can, they can talk to. And it's not necessarily, in, in my opinion, a case of as much as they should, but as much as, as much as they can. It's the, the environment that they're in, um, and who they feel that they can speak to about this, about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If it feels like, um, that they, they can't talk about it, then yeah, maybe they should, but it's the, the feeling of, oh, I, I can't talk about it. Yeah. And um, makes it difficult for, for people to actually be able to, to voice, voice what they're, they're, they're feeling, um, and be able to actually speak up about the, the, Mental, issue, mental health issues that they are facing. Okay. Have you ever struggled with your mental health and what helped? Yeah, I have probably on a couple of occasions, but the, the biggest one was definitely through lockdown mm -hmm. and online school especially. Um, and it, it's it's kind of, I've, I've touched on it already, it's, I, I found only school very difficult um, for whatever reason. I just couldn't get get that the balance right yeah. um I, I remember speaking about like not being able to see a light at the end of the tunnel and it just and it was a motivation thing for pretty much everything i just didn't have any motivation to do anything mm -hmm. um and yeah it was it was tough but i think what helped was i was pretty pretty good student in school was pretty good academically and i, I touched upon it like what the, the trigger was was my my game teacher who I absolutely love he's a legend but um he he noticed this because i've known them since first year yeah. and he, he noticed that like i wasn't engaging and um like he, he knew that wasn't like me at all and I, I knew it wasn't like me as well but i didn't want to make that first step because yeah. i was kind of in, in denial it was like it was all quite overwhelming mm -hmm. i didn't imagine it was for a lot of people during uh, the lockdown um yeah because I, I was shielding as well at the start of lockdown yeah. which made it sort of even more tough for me to like see that it could get better again uh -huh. um but i i think that it was i was i was spoken to first um and that's that's what helped me if you could give one piece of advice to someone like you like a young teenage boy or just a guy that's in his teenage years um, that's sort of struggling with their mental health right now, what would it be? I think a huge thing is the the masculinity, boys don't cry complex. Like I myself had on a point of principle had never been a hyper masculine guy. Yeah. I'd never really believed in masculinity or anything like that. But I felt like even it was there subconsciously mm -hmm. um when I was dealing with it because I didn't want anybody to to see me or, or speak to me and the, the the way the way that it was initially um i felt that yeah i, I didn't I, I was almost like internalized um yeah. that i didn't want to sh show face in that way um i was very private about it just hid, hid away to myself and kept it in for a long time just thinking oh i'll, I'll deal with it I've, yeah. I've got to cope with it myself um but then as as time went on and it was actually my guidance teacher and he's a, he's a guy as well i think even having that just the smallest of conversations can then and being open about it can then knock on it's like a yeah a, not not quite a, a butterfly effect but it's like a almost like dominoes yeah. knocking over and um, this one thing leads to another gavin spoke a lot about the pandemic and covid19 and how that was a tough time for a lot of people with their mental health. Another person that spoke about this and their sort of journey during lockdown was Chris Santos. Hi, my name is Chris Santos. I, I am 19 years old and I'm studying social science. I am a problem at he, him. I am wearing a t-shirt with patterns on it. So obviously COVID-19 had a massive effect on a lot of young people's lives, especially, and mine as well. And that's the thing that's a starting point for me when I realized that like, um, I had issues with like how I felt at the time and I kind of like 
didn't find like a support system to kind of talk about it. So for me, I went through a lot of loneliness and obviously a bit of depression, and that was very difficult at the time to kind of like be alone. And I felt isolated, even though I was with my family. Um, I felt like I couldn't reach out to my friends, or I didn't have like like good friends at the time. So I wasn't like in a position to kind of like have like a good support line for me. So. I feel like after like obviously talking to like a few people and you know getting back on track after any pandemic I'm in a much better space but I think that was the start for me to realize that I'm not always gonna be happy or content there's times when I'm gonna be a bit sad and a bit down. It's the culture surrounding it as well so I think in my experience personally I think it's been harder to kind of speak about it at home um, in terms of like if you are from a certain religion or you believe like in a higher power or anything like that um, or maybe like you're part of like a group that is not very aware of issues like that, like mental health, um, especially in Britain. Like after World War One and World War Two, there's been, there's been this big stigma about men being strong or like being perceived as strong or not being able to openly talk about these issues. I feel like, uh, from my experience, uh, I was along the same lines where like they constantly told me not to cry or men don't cry and like openly myself emotionally, which is like a big issue because if you can't talk about the subjects, like if you can't talk about what you're dealing with then you're more likely to kind of like um, find it difficult in life to go through and stuff like that. I would say treat mental health as you have treated COVID-19, so as a world um, issue. Um, obviously it's not as recognizable and it's not a virus, but it's definitely affecting a lot of young people's mental health and that should be a priority. Um, what would you say to world leaders about the growing mental health crisis? I think they should definitely start taking it seriously because it has affected some people. So many young people stay at home because they don't want to leave their houses. Well, these old men that are like running the country just stay at, just have parties and having a great time because they don't care. What would you say to teachers about the growing mental health crisis? Um, they need to be aware that when someone has mental health um, difficulties that they really can't do something that might seem really obvious like for example um, they may struggle to get um, their thoughts in order and um, make decisions things like that and it could really impact on their schoolwork and potentially need a little bit more time and understanding you know you wouldn't expect someone with a broken leg to run a marathon and if you're struggling with your mental health um, and bad thoughts things like that it's really difficult to just think of things that you should and need to do in a sequence or in a helpful manner. Schools have like guidance counselors but they don't do anything. I think schools should do a lot more about it and I think people that are in politics should definitely think about it a lot more because it's affecting so many people. It's good to see that sorry speaking about it a lot more. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's still not done enough about it. Like no. there's not really any help you can get if you are struggling. And if you do, it takes years to actually be able to get anything. Like, even if you're depressed, it takes years and years until you get the medication you need. And people don't feel comfortable. It's just awful. Another person who I spoke to was Victoria, and she spoke in a similar sense to Ramiza about identity and how identity plays quite a big and significant role in mental health. Fabulous. Okay, so please introduce yourself. Um, okay, so I'm Victoria Orlika. Um, I am a 20 year old student from Edinburgh Napier and I study journalism. Um, I'm currently, um, a volunteer, but I'm also running a project called Shia Empowerment. And I also, um, I work at Abelauer and I'm doing a current internship with the learning through landscapes. So yeah, awesome. that's kind of. So you're yeah. busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Amazing. One of the people I've already spoken to. Um, is Ramiza and she was talking about her identity and her religion and how that plays quite an important part of her mental health and the way that she sees her mental health mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I find quite interesting it's also something that you have sort of experience with um, mm -hmm. so do you maybe want to tell me a wee bit more about that? Well I come from Poland originally I've been living in Scotland for 12 years now it's been 12 years on the 15th of June actually this year um, and I'm also Catholic uh, because in Poland, being a Catholic is a very dominating thing, I suppose. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that a lot of it is that kind of my mental health has been kind of impacted because firstly, I think I've, I think I associate a lot of negative things with being a different nationality yeah. to everyone else, especially being in Scotland and kind of almost sometimes forgetting that I'm Polish, you know? <laughs> Um, so sometimes I kind of always associate negative things with it because firstly, I've always thought that I was just a different, like being yeah, almost okay. because I was from a different country and different like nationality and I spoke different languages. So I always kind of associate that. So I almost kind of already seen myself as a bad thing. And then when people who are other people who are Polish and had Scottish friends, I was just like, how? Like, cause I, it just, the concept of that was like, I w- you want to be friends with a Polish person? Not in that way that like, I would say, oh, Polish people shouldn't be friends yeah, with other people, no. but it was, I think it was just my internal thing that like, you know, um, put me in that perspective of, oh, well, now that like, I'm from a different country, I don't deserve to be surrounded by people who are from, you know, because I'm this bad thing or because I don't speak their language type of thing or because they don't speak my language and yeah. it's I think it's more so the identity around like it, the difficult part about being from a different country and trying to fit in uh, in the culture and also you know because I I don't understand that like we both are white countries but the culture was different and the language barrier the language barrier was a whole, the, the worst thing I'd say because I've had people approach me and tell me to go back to my own country yeah. um, or I've had difficulties with, you know, making friends at the start because I can talk to their language. Um, and I think that part of it was also kind of just in general, I guess it was a, a stigma around children who were not really familiar with someone being from yeah. a foreign country and still being white and being from a foreign country and not speaking their language. But at the same time, also it was a kind of idea that like, yeah, I'm different, but like, just in general kind of the language and people not really knowing how to go about talking to me because they've never spoken my language before. Mental health problems can affect anyone, but they're more common among people who are LGBT+. Being part of this community doesn't cause these problems, but some things that these types of people go through can affect their mental health, such as discrimination, homophobia or transphobia, social isolation, rejection and difficult experiences coming out. According to the Mental Health Foundation, almost half of transgender people had thought about taking their own life. Ash tells us his story. Hello, I'm Ashton Maguire. I go by he, him pronouns. I have black hair, a white t-shirt and I'm wearing a blue jumper. Um, for a very long time, I dealt with really, really bad mental health. I had quite severe depression for a very long time. Um, and so I didn't know who I was and what I wanted to do with my life or if I even wanted to be here. And so that caused a lot of struggle in my life. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was really hard to deal with. I mean, I've always had the notion that I was different from other people when I was younger. I was never really identified with the gender I was when I was younger, but it was never really accepted until I was old enough to fully express it in the way that I wanted Mm -hmm. to. When I was 11 years old, that was the first time that I came out of the closet, but then I had to go back into the closet due to family issues and not enough support. And then until I came out again, um, I dealt with a lot of really, really bad mental health issues. I was struggling to go to school. I was struggling to interact with people. And when I came out again, Oh, I think that was one of the happiest moments that I've ever been through. Um, and I think that transgender people and LGBT people are just not supported as much because it's still seen as quite a stigmatised topic. Yeah, definitely. And would you say that there's a lack of support for people within the LGBT plus community and specifically the trans community? Oh yeah, um, there's a huge lack of support. I mean, I've been... Uh, in Scotland, there's one gender clinic, Sandyford, mm-hmm. and I've been on the waiting list for five years now. Um, I started my transition at 12, and I'm now 17 years old. I still haven't heard anything back from me. It's awful. Mm-hmm. Really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could change one thing, would it be sort of more readily available places for people to go if they're experiencing like gender dysphoria and problems with their mental health that sort of relate to that? Yeah. I, I also think that just it becoming a more support topic within society would just bring a lot of those things forward The owl and the chimpanzee went to sea 
in a beautiful book called The Mind. The owl was sensible, clever and smart, but the chimp was a little behind. The owl made decisions based on fact and knew where to steer his ship. The chimp reacted a little too fast and often the boat would tip. The waves would come and crash aboard, the chimp would start to cry. Large tears would roll right down his face, afraid that he would die. The chimp and the owl would wrestle at night when the world was quiet and still. The chimp would jump up and rock the boat and the boat would start to fill. Then the owl stepped in and grabbed a pail and started to empty it out and the chimp would start to get cross and would often scream and shout. The battle continued night after night until the chimp started to see that if it let the owl take control a more peaceful night it would be. Resilience by Alex Early. Look at you, still standing, after being knocked down and thrown out. Look at you, still growing, after being picked and plucked and prodded out of your own home. Look at you, still dancing and singing, after being defeated and disassembled. Look at you, love, still here and hopeful, after it all. Of those living in rural and remote communities, many have limited access to mental health support due to lack of facilities and other factors, such as little or no regular public transport. Living in rural and remote areas often means people can feel socially isolated. This can contribute to stress, anxiety and depression, which can have detrimental effects on people's mental health and well-being. I spoke to Molly, who's from the Highlands, about her perspective of rural mental health. Hi, my name is Molly. I am 19. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm from Highlands and I'm wearing a white top and a black jacket with my awesome daisy jeans. <laughs> uh, and I have brown hair. Do you think that people talk about mental health as much as they should? Right, see the thing is, I think that they do, but not in the right context. So people talk about the general overarching mental health and how to improve mental health and how it's deteriorating, but they don't talk about their own mental health and how like problems that are affecting them. So like, it's such a buzzword at the moment, like everyone wants to tackle mental health and see how it can be improved, but then just won't do things in their own lives to improve their own. It's just... Oh, it's so frustrating because we are making steps in the right direction to tackle the stigma but people won't tackle their own personal stigma. You have a unique perspective because you're from the Highlands. Do you think that living in a rural place changes your perspective of mental health? Yeah, well rural deprivation is a huge thing so most people that live in rural areas are actually like poorer than their urban counterparts even though that when you think of Glasgow you might think of a poor area but by on average people that live in cities are obviously more wealthy than they can get around. Rural deprivation is absolutely huge because not only is there um, like poverty and stuff in local communities, there's the isolation that comes from being a away from the rest of the community, which also adds to the mental health epidemic. Like it's just so bad, especially during the pandemic. I mean, that was absolutely rough. I couldn't leave my hometown for six months, which I don't think is something I've ever done before since I was like four or something. Like, it was ridiculous. We need to be able to to move around and to travel and to go further than our town of 2,000 people. Um, but that wasn't a possibility at the time. Did you always care? 
Is to hear you say my name one last time.